my Thunderbirds t-shirt. It's got all the ships on it. Five, four, three, two, one, Thunderbirds are go. Howdy folks, Jamboreeky here. In the last episode of Puppet Panic, I reviewed Thunderbirds Are Go, the first ever feature-length Thunderbirds movie. And in this episode, I'm going to review its sequel, Thunderbirds 6. But before I do, here's a little info on what Thunderbirds is, because some of you are probably thinking, what the hell is a Thunderbird? Is it some kind of cake? Thunderbirds was a British sci-fi puppet show created and produced by Jerry and Sylvia Anderson. It was about the renowned Tracy family and their jobs as the members of the International Rescue Team. All five Tracy brothers had their own Thunderbirds, which were special ships with unique purposes. It was a groundbreaking show that took puppetry, pyrotechnics and miniature sets to new levels. It proved that puppet filmmaking could be used to tell thrilling action stories and be just as ambitious as any live action production. With all that being said, let's talk about Thunderbird 6. Thunderbird 6 is a sci-fi thriller based on the Thunderbirds TV show. After International Rescue's resident engineer, Brains, has his fancy new airship Skyship 1 built, members of the International Rescue team agree to be guests on its maiden voyage. The Skyship 1 is destined to take its guests to different countries, but unfortunately, it's secretly been taken over by terrorists who are acting as the airship crew. Meanwhile, Brains has been assigned to design the brand new 6 Thunderbird. Can Brains make Thunderbird 6 be as awesome and useful as the other ships? And will our heroes be able to stop these sneaky terrorists? So, I had lukewarm feelings about the first Thunderbirds movie, Thunderbirds Are Go. My problem was that its entertainment value kept going up and down. Sometimes it was fun, tense, and even a little bit comical. But at other times, it took itself way too seriously and led to some awkwardly boring scenes. I also thought that it didn't feel cinematic enough for a feature-length adaptation of a TV show. I personally think that Thunderbird 6 is a huge improvement on the first film, so let's take a sophisticated look at it as I explain why it's a step above Thunderbirds Are Go. This sequel doesn't take itself as seriously as the first film, and has more fun with itself without getting too silly. I mean, the first movie had a Cliff Richard dream sequence. There's plenty of humorous and playful scenes that give the film a lively spirit. Plus, the world travel holiday that our characters take is actually really relaxing and enjoyable to watch thanks to the laid-back, light-hearted tone. It's also interesting seeing the different countries that they visit. How are you doing, Tintin? Fine. Just fine. Switch in thrusters. Okay. Plus, it's pretty funny when the film cuts back to Brain as he tries again and again to make a Thunderbird 6 that pleases his boss. Watching him slowly start to go bonkers from the constant rejections is really amusing. Creative frustration is a relatable scenario, which makes it even funnier. Of course I understand, Mr. Tracy. It isn't quite the thing you had in mind. Of course I don't mind designing yet another one. You know, Scott, one of the remarkable things about Brains is that he never loses his temper. Well, if he did, I wouldn't blame him after all the work he's done. Upset? Me upset? Of course I'm not upset! <laughs> However, this film isn't all laughs, giggles, and holiday fun. The overall story is brilliant and adds tension to the character's holiday. To avoid causing a stir and ruining the major operation, the head terrorist uses charming charisma and devious methods to trick Lady Penelope into saying the sentences that they require for a fake message they're trying to contrive, to trick the International Rescue Headquarters. This is actually a sly and sneaky way of discreetly using Lady Penelope to their advantage without creating conflict with the international rescue members on board the ship. Although, our heroes aren't completely naive, and once they become suspicious, they try to cautiously stay one step ahead of the terrorists. So your rooms aren't bugged, but the lounge, bar and dining room are. All places where I go. It would seem it's me they want the information from. What follows is a tense game between international rescue members and the terrorists, as they try to outdo each other without giving away too much to the other side. It's really entertaining watching both sides trying to outwit each other. The fact that the airship is secretly bugged with recording equipment adds even more pressure to the situation and gives our heroes an interesting disadvantage. Hang on. 
What if something in my room is bugged? <laughs> my phone! My phone has a chip inside it! You must break it upon! Take it out! So the Facebook can stop spying on me! Ah! This movie also feels like a proper film. The setting of the airship is fantastic to look at. It has an awesome design with a weird retro interior decor and futuristic rooms. It helps the film look cinematically and visually unique in many ways. Plus, the villains pose as a legitimate threat while developing an interesting rivalry with our heroes. There's also some consistently engaging action sequences, from dramatic gunfights to a showdown on an aircraft. <laughs> The puppetry for the film isn't exactly notably different from the first film. The puppets glazed over expressions do make it hard to read their emotions, reactions and thoughts, but once again the puppeteers take advantage of their limitations by using subtle and discreet shifts, nods and tiny movements to support the characters' dry performances. I will admit that there are occasions where puppets' heads did move a bit too much, but for the most part, this puppeteering technique works in the film's favour. My only nitpick would have to be with the Black Phantom puppet, the character behind the terrorist attack, who is clearly the Dark Hood puppet with a wig on, a villain from the first movie and the TV show. Sylvia Anderson has called him Hood Jr. in the film's audio commentary, but the film itself never confirms this, so it just makes it kind of a lazy way of recycling a used puppet, a very well-known puppet to Thunderbirds fans at that. He's an iconic villain in the franchise, so it's not like some people wouldn't recognize the similarity. It's like if the villain for Star Wars Episode 7 was just going to be Darth Vader with a top hat, a mustache, and the name of Lord Fancy Pants III. People would notice, particularly Star Wars fans. Objectively, I can see this not being a problem for people outside the fan base. So like I said, it's just a nitpick. Before I give my final verdict on this movie, if you enjoyed this review then feel free to click like to show your appreciation, click subscribe to see more videos like this one, and share so more people can enjoy my work. Cheers folks! Bye bye! To conclude, Thunderbird 6 is a very entertaining movie full of action, frills, and a dry sense of humour. Unlike the first film, it doesn't take itself too seriously, and instead goes for a light-hearted tone while also providing some solid, excellent tension. I really enjoyed this film and totally recommend it, especially if you're a Thunderbirds fan. So, what is the next puppet movie I'm going to put on strings to see if it doesn't fall down? Well, it's a movie I want to review to celebrate the month of Halloween. Little Shop of Horrors. Cheerio, folks! <laughs>